Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Bob, for having me. Thank you, everyone, for being here, taking some time out of your evening to learn about some uh, invasive species that are out there uh, that I look for in these surveys. Uh, my name is Alicia. I am the Indiana State Survey Coordinator for the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. So for the first part of this presentation, I will briefly discuss what this program is for anyone who's not familiar with it. And then I will go over a few of the invasive species targets that I search for. So the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey, or CAPS, is a government survey targeting exotic plant pests that are of national concern. So that's where the cooperative comes in, is that this is a national effort to look for these invasive species that would cause problems in the country. The CAPS program falls under APHIS PPQ. Uh, if you don't know, P PPQ stands for Plant Protection and Quarantine. And this agency is within the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service of the USDA. PPQ works to safeguard agricultural ag agriculture and natural resources in the US against the entry, establishment, and spread of animal and pet plant pests and noxious weeds in order to protect our food supply. So PPQ is out conducting inspections of international commodities that are coming into the country, and they are the agency that facilitates trade. They are the first line of defense against the entry of invasive species. So CAPS underneath PPQ kind of functions as the second line of defense. So CAPS goes out and looks for some of these pests that may have entered into the environment with the goal of detecting them as early as possible so that we can respond before the pest establishes. So we're kind of an early detection system looking for things that are not here yet, but would be a major problem if they were introduced. So federal funding is provided to state collaborators to fulfill the CAPS mission. In Indiana, the state contracts Purdue to conduct the surveys. So that's why I am at Purdue, that's why I'm housed here. Um, and every year the CAPS committee uh, gets together and decides upon the list of targets for the following year. So the targets are based on the national priority pest list. And this is a list of invasive species that is provided to us by PPQ. And from there, the states can decide which targets are relevant to their commodities. Not all states have the same plants, of course, so we have to kind of tailor that to what's here. So in Indiana, we focus on forestry, which is our exotic wood borer and bark beetle survey. We, of course, uh, focus on field crops. That's our big, big one here. And we also do a nursery and ornamental survey. States can also use this funding to survey for pests that are not on the national priority list. Um, a lot of states do this if they have commodities that are very, maybe very unique to their state but are still important to their state. Um, so they'll use this funding to survey for those as well. But it's required that at least 60% of the targets on our list come from the national pest priority list. So on the right, you can see our most recent CAPS targets list for Indiana. Uh, I will not be discussing every single pest on this list. Um, that would take way too long. And some of these Bob has actually already presented on. Um, so I've selected some that have kind of like visible unique characteristics that I think um, people would be able to identify if they were to see it. And things that I think would be important and relevant to Indiana uh, citizens. I'll be giving a brief overview of the pest, why it's important, and then showing you a few characteristics of that pest or pathogen that you can use to be on the lookout for it. So if you notice the icons that I've placed uh, next to each survey title, you'll see those again as I go through the pests, and that will help to orient you as to which survey the insect is a part of. So there's another icon that you're going to see next to the pests. 
that I'll be discussing and um, are, which are these three, which indicate the method that I'm going to use to survey for these pests. So I use three primary methods for the CAP surveys. We use visual surveys, and that simply means we go out and look for it. Um, we also use a physical trap. So this catches insect samples that we then sort through and look for the target. And we also do tissue sampling. So this is primarily for diseases. Okay, so let's jump into some pests. So the first one that I will be talking about is the large pine weevil. The large pine weevil is a part of our forestry survey. So the exotic wood borer and bark beetle survey. And it is something we trap for, um, but it's large enough that you could easily spot the adults if, if you were to be looking for these and they were here. I think these are very distinct. So why is this a pest? Why is this pest a threat to the US? So this is a major pest of conifers, especially spruce and pine, which is where it gets its name. And these are extremely important trees in the US and in Indiana. It can also spread fungal diseases to those trees. Um, so that's another factor that makes it important. It's spreading disease as well as eating the tree uh, outer bark. The larvae of this species develops in the stumps and the roots of dead trees. And that isn't so bad, but the adults, like I said, will feed on the bark of live trees, um, primarily the outer bark, and will girdle the trees and eventually kill them. Um, Another thing that makes this significant, these adults have a lifespan of up to four years, and that's a very long time for insects. Um, so this is a long time for adults to be around uh, killing and eating trees. They're especially serious to young plantations of, of pines. So this is a distribution map from the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization um, showing where this insect has been detected. So something to keep in mind about these maps, I will be using these for all of the pests that I'm presenting on today, but they are not necessarily showing where a pest is established. So it's only really showing where it is known to have been present or intercepted. It may have been detected only a handful of times, and it will show up the same on this map as a country with a large established population. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're looking at this, it's not necessarily showing that this insect is abundant in all of these countries. So currently the insect is present throughout Europe and Asia. Um, it's a major pest of conifers in the UK, Conservative estimates suggest that the direct cost of damage to forest owners in the UK in this region is of roughly 5 million pounds per year. All right, so what do these look like? What should you look for if you're somebody who has pines or spruce or other conifers um, and you wanna keep this in the back of your mind? The adults are pretty large. They're about a half an inch long. They're purple to reddish brown, depending on the age. The younger beetles will lean purple, while the older ones will look more reddish brown. They have patches of yellow scales on their elytra. The elytra are the hard outer wings there on their back. And they also have two patches of yellow scales on their head, kind of right in between their eyes. Another important feature is the strong tooth on each femur. So I've got an arrow here pointing to that. This is a distinct feature of this weevil. The feeding damage of this insect is also pretty distinct. They eat the outer bark and they don't usually eat the inner bark. So you'll see these kind of large, irregular, patchy feeding patterns on the young growth. Um, so this is definitely a sign of these Weevils, so if you have a conifer plantation or you have these on your property, um, again, just kind of keep this in the back of your mind if you ever see damage like this. And um, if you see this beetle or something that you think looks like this beetle, uh, maybe consider sending it in. All right, so I am going through these pretty quickly because I just want to get through a few that I think folks will be able to 
um, identified. So let's move on to the next one is the cucurbit beetle. So this is an insect that we survey for in the field crop survey. And this is a visual survey. So that means we stomp through corn or soybean on foot to look for this one. So if you're somebody who's growing these crops or you're a, you scout in these crops at any point, uh, this is a good one to keep, keep your eye out for. Um, so why is this one a big deal? Well, it eats a huge variety of crops. So it's highly polyphagous, meaning it will eat a, a lot of different things. So it would be a major problem for growers. It's an important pest of corn, beans, tomatoes, and orchard crops. All of those are important for Indiana. It also causes damage to watermelon, squash, wheat, and tomato. Um, the adults feed on all of the above ground tissues. They damage leaves and fruit, and the larvae will feed on the roots. So this insect will damage every single part of the plant. So right now this insect is in South America, so it's not too far from us. Um, so it could not only reach us through trade, but this one may be able to reach us just through nat uh, natural migration. So what do these look like? Um, the adults are about five to seven millimeters long or about a quarter inch. Uh, so they're not too big. Um, they have, they're bright green with these yellow transverse spots. They have three of those on each wing. And if you look at the two uppermost spots, they have a reddish band kind of around the outer edge of that yellow spot. And that's a really important feature of the adults. The head is also the same dark reddish brown color. So there are some other species around that look similar to this one. So I wanted to go ahead and compare it so you can see what makes this one distinct. Uh, the image on the left is the banded cucumber beetle. So if you're in the South or if you've ever been down there, this one is very common. Um, I used to live in Florida and I would see this all over the place. Um, but notice that this on this one, there are four bands on each wing and there are, there's no dark brown spots on the lateral side of the top band. So if you compare that to speciosa, you can see the top of that, uh, the top uh, spot, sorry, I'm trying to say this uh, easily, but it's the kind of the, that reddish color on the lateral side there. All right, so, this is another comparison image here. So again, I have the banded cucumber beetle on the left and uh, Diabrotica speciosa in the middle. So you can see those two. These are specimens from the Purdue collection here. Our collections manager was very nice to take these for me. So again, you can kind of see the difference in the band patterns on those wings. And then on the right is in an image of the spotted cucumber beetle or the southern corn rootworm. And this one is really widespread in North America. So this one might be more familiar to those of us in the northern part of the country. I notice that it has several black spots and a black head, while speciosa has yellow bands, again, with the reddish brown on that top spot. The damage that you'll notice from this species is going to be similar to other insects that cause chewing damage. Um, so you'll see, you know, holes, really large uh, feeding holes with these adults. Looks pretty similar to anything else that's chewing on uh, or causing feeding damage to a crop. They're also going to be feeding on the roots. So the root biomass will be decreased, uh, which isn't something you can see above ground, but you'll notice that the plants will start to fall over. So in corn, it's called lodging. Um, so this is a symptom that you're having pretty severe feeding damage on the roots. Um, so this will also occur with this species. Okay, so next let's talk about a disease target that's in the CAPS program. This one is called Philippine Downy Mildew. 
So this disease is a part of our field crop survey. And for this one, we collect samples and submit that to the Purdue Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic for diagnosis. So why is this disease important? So downy mildews of maize, sorghum, and sugarcane are among the world's most destructive diseases. And Philippine downy mildew is considered the most virulent of all the downy mildew pathogens that infect maize. So what do we mean by most virulent? That just means it has the most extreme symptoms. Uh, in places where this pathogen is present, the yield losses can be up to 40 to 60% uh, that have been observed in corn specifically and losses up to 25% in sugarcane. So this is a pretty devastating loss for growers. However, it's not very well known if there's a high risk of long distance transmission of this pathogen. It spreads through infected host material, which isn't moved internationally. Uh, the seeds tend to be the part of the plant that's moved. And spread through infected seed is possible, but it's very, very rare. And the seed from the infected areas is rarely exported out of the country. So this one's unlikely to show up, but it's always good to kind of be aware of it, uh, especially if you grow corn and you notice uh, suddenly you have a disease where your uh, control measures are failing and you're having an extreme case of uh, disease outbreak. So this disease is endemic in the Philippines, of course. It's also been detected in a handful of Southeast, Southeastern and West Asian countries. So what are the, some symptoms that you could look for or be aware of that might indicate Philippine downy mildew? In the early stages, the disease appears as long chlorotic stripes on the leaves. Uh, and as it progresses, the leaves will look sort of grayish green and dried out kind of abnormally erect. There will also be a white downy covering on the undersides of the leaves. So here's a real close up image. You can kind of see that powdery white fuzz on the bottom of the leaf. Now, something to remember uh, that this disease cannot be diagnosed visually. And there are other downy mildews out there of grass that look pretty similar to this. So sending a sample is absolutely essential to actually identify this. Um, probably the most noticeable difference from a grower's perspective, again, would be how severe the disease is. Um, this isn't very likely to show up again, and the Purdue Plant Disease Clinic already looks for this one on all the corn samples that people submit every year. But I do think it's important for growers to be kind of aware of this exotic disease in case you notice something out of the ordinary. Um, you can keep this in the back of your mind and maybe consider sending a sample to us. Uh, it would help with our survey. And at the very least, it would add to our existing negative data for this disease that proves we don't have it here. Um, while I'm on the subject of grower involvement, I did wanna take a moment here to share a quote from the USDA's official risk assessment for this disease. Uh, they're specifically talking about Philippine downy mildew here, but I feel like it's true for most of the targets on my list. So I wanted to share this quote with you. Quote, the most likely scenario for discovery of a downy mildew select agent in maize in the United States, whether introduced deliberately or accidentally, is notice of symptoms by a grower that leads to contact with a county agent or farm management professional for diagnosis, end quote. And I just really liked this because I think it emphasizes the importance of the citizen's input into this process. You know, we're out there looking for these, those of us who do surveys, the PPQ is looking for it, DNR is looking for things, but, you know, we have limited scope and we don't have the personnel power to look at every single field all the time. So engaging with growers and the community is vital to finding these uh, before they become a really bad widespread problem. Okay, so I'll move on now. So let's talk about a weed. This one's for the plant folks out there. Uh, this is 
a, a called red witch weed. So red witch weed is a part of our field crop survey. And this is a visual survey. So we look for this one uh, on foot. Why is this plant a threat? This is an obligate parasite of grasses. So for Indiana, it's a major threat to corn. It depletes the host nutrients and significantly reduces the yield. Uh, this one's also very close to home for us. It's currently in North and South Carolina and it has been under eradication there for quite a while. Um, the USDA report on the witch weed eradication program predicted that this weed could cause biomass reductions of up to 95 to 100% in corn. So this is a huge deal for Indiana and the rest of the Midwestern Corn Belt too. Uh, for an example, in Africa, over 100 million people have suffered crop damage estimated between 20 and 80%, equivalent to approximately $1 billion per year. So this is a real nasty one. So this plant is widespread uh, throughout Africa and Asia, where it is endemic. Uh, it has been detected in Pacific Islands and in Australia. And as I mentioned previously, it's also here in the US. So let's zoom in here. So it's here in the Carolinas. It was first detected in a field in uh, Columbus County, North Carolina in 1956, and it has since spread to South Carolina. So since its introduction, uh, it's um, the federal state cooperative program has eliminated over 99% of 432,000 acres that have been infested with witchweed in the Carolinas. So it's a pretty intense eradication program. It has been fairly successful. And so far the weed has not moved out of that area. So um, it's not actively spreading anymore as far as I could tell from the recent reports that have come out. But because of how big of a threat that is to our commodities, I still think this is an important one to, to look for. So what does this weed look like? So remember that these are obligate parasites, so they will always be associated with a grass crop. So look for small flowers. They're less than 1.3 centimeters in diameter. Uh, even though this is called a red witch weed, uh, they come in a variety of colors depending on the region, including white, yellow, or purple. Uh, in North Carolina, the photos I see are usually yellow or red. Um, so here in the U.S. probably will be red or yellow. I've seen uh, clusters of them where the red and yellow are interspersed. So the leaves are linear and they're arranged oppositely on the stem. Let's see, I think I have, there we go. So there's opposite orientation of leaves, they're linear shape, and the stems are also very hairy. So they're covered in this kind of fine bulbous uh, hair follicles. All right, so before you see the weed at all though, you'll probably notice the symptoms. Uh, that's where the term witch weed comes from is that you'll see these symptoms long before you see what's actually causing it. The symptoms look a lot like drought, including stunting, wilting, leaf curling, and scorched leaf edges. Uh, early on, the symptoms are indistinguishable from drought. So, if you're seeing these kinds of symptoms and you know that you're not in a drought, that could be a strong indicator of this weed being present. All right, so next on my list is boxwood blight. We're moving on to some ornamental targets. This is a fungal disease. So you may have heard of this one because it's uh, pretty close to here. Uh, this is part of our ornamental survey and requires a sample submission to diagnose it. Um, it's a fungal disease, as I mentioned, and it's a threat to nursery production and landscaping industries. Um, so this one is a regulatory concern for anyone who grows this at their facility. It has been detected in Europe, 
uh, parts of Western Asia and the Middle East. Uh, it's also right here in the US and Canada. That's one of the reasons I picked this one uh, because it is here in Indiana. So let's zoom in here. So if you have boxwoods or you grow them, this is a relevant one for you. Uh, it first arrived in North Carolina in 2011 and has since spread around the US. Um, it has been in Indiana since 2018. The symptoms of boxwood blight start as dark leaf spots, and these leaf spots are going to grow and coalesce into large brown blotches. The spots have a lighter reddish center with a dark like kind of brown border around that center. You'll notice defoliation on the lower branches first, and that defoliation will start to move up into the upper branches. There will also be uh, black cankers on the stems. And there we go. There will be uh, white sporulation coming out of those cankers. You'll also see that sporulation on the undersides of the leaf spots. Again, this has to be diagnosed in a laboratory. So if you see something like this, uh, please send it into the disease clinic. All right, so still on boxwoods, we're gonna look at an insect pest of boxwoods that is on our doorstep. This is called the box tree moth. So this is also part of the ornamental survey and we use a trap for this one. Uh, this is another serious threat to the boxwood industry. So the larvae of this insect feed on the leaves and cause really severe defoliation. So again, this is a nursery threat um, and a threat to our boxwood industry in the United States. It is present throughout Europe, uh, in some Asian countries, and has recently be been detected in the US. Uh, it's not in many states yet, but it's right on our doorstep here in Michigan. I first got to the US and New York in 2021, and it's been confirmed in Michigan last year, uh, November, 2022. So this is relatively new, um, but it's still here and we're still looking for it here in Indiana. So this is an important one to look for. The adults have two color forms. The white form is the more common one. Uh, the white form has the white wings and white body with a brown border around the wing. The brown form is solid brown, uh, shown at the top photo. Both of the forms have a distinct white dot in the middle of the forewing. I think I've got, there we go. So on the white form, it kind of looks like a moon shape in my opinion. Uh, in the dark form, it's more like a triangle, but in both of those forms, the white spot will be present. When looking for the larvae or looking at a larvae, its most important feature is that it's feeding on a boxwood. Uh, there's a lot of lepidopter and larvae that look like this, that resemble this exact uh, species, but no other species in the US will be feeding on boxwoods or they're not feeding specialists on boxwoods. The larvae are greenish yellow. They have two rows of black spots on their back. Uh, the older kind of larger ones will have dark green stripes as well. Their head is black and there's a white Y shape on their head. Uh, they also use silk to join the leaves together. So seeing silk cocoons in your boxwood might be a sign of these larvae. So if you have boxwood plants or you grow them, uh, definitely keep, keep an eye out for this one. All right, the last target I'm gonna talk about is sudden oak death. And this is a disease of oak trees and other ornamental plants. This disease is a part of our ornamental survey. Uh, not only can it cause mortality in oak trees, but it causes twig and foliar diseases in several ornamental species as well such as rhododendrons, camellias, viburnums, lilacs, magnolias. It has a pretty wide host range of over a hundred different plants. So this is a regulatory concern for nurseries and it's also a threat to our natural environments due to its 
uh, mortality of oak trees. This pathogen is present throughout Europe. There have been some recent detections in East Asia and South America as well. Uh, in the US, it's widespread throughout California primarily. It's also present in Oregon. You'll notice that Indiana is shown here uh, to have this disease present. But again, as I mentioned earlier, these maps don't distinguish between an interception and a fully established outbreak. So in Indiana, it's not currently known to occur in the landscape, but plant material containing this pathogen has been intercepted here uh, several times over the last decade. So it's important to keep an eye out for this one. You know, it has been detected before, but it's not currently established here. The symptoms of this disease on oaks include calluses on the woody portion of the tree, and seeping black or red ooze. Uh, on oaks and on other plants, you'll see leaf spots and twig dieback. Um, these symptoms are not incredibly specific to this disease, so it's um, something that has to be diagnosed with molecular uh, tests. So if you have some of these plants, you see symptoms like this, uh, you might want to report it or get with an extension agent, see if submitting a sample to the disease clinic is worthwhile. Okay, well, that's the last one I had. Uh, I wanna thank Bob again for giving me the opportunity to present. Thank you everyone for being here and taking the time to learn about the CAPS program. I have my contact information here, as well as the Purdue uh, Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab, and of course the link to Report Invasives.